I wish I had some sort of mind-blowing revelation that could let you know that this show was, in fact, awful. But I also wish I had some mind-blowing revelation that told you that this show was fantastic. My review of Episode 2, True Detective. That's right, friends. I am the man you may know as Z from Our Reviews Will Kill You, and I am here to do a review of Episode 2. And based on my previous episode, I'll, I have to do some things. I got to do some housekeeping. Got to clean some things up here so that we're all on the pa same page. I do read comments, and they did enlighten me as the original show creator and writer of True Detective Season 1, Nick Palazzo, is not involved, as far as I can tell, in this show whatsoever. The uh, showrunner, writer, director, Issa Flores, I think her name is. I don't know for sure. But either way, um, she's completely responsible about uh, for this. There's no connection. Nick Palazzo had another idea. And I compared it to why I thought like season one had problems. I mean, I love it. I think it's a fantastic um, season of television. One of the best I've seen in, in forever. And But part of the problem is the plagiarism. Now, this is a completely original story loosely connected to True Detective. Apparently, the symbol that appears in Season 1 appears in this one, but they don't seem to have really have a true connection to it. It's just a thing. She thought it would be a nice Easter egg, is the story that I read. So, for those of you who hate me for reviewing this, thank you for watching. For those of you who hate or love me for reviewing this, thank you for watching. I will make a couple other points. It's not as woke as we think it is. Just because it's got two women in it and it's lame does not mean that they are gay. Because they have quite clearly proven in these past two episodes that they are not gay. Fair enough. But I think I will be more specific in my criticisms this time. And I'll tell you what I like too. So, um, do I recommend this show? That is a no. I still do not recommend the show. And uh, let's take a look at the article and the recap. We'll talk a little bit about it because I think that can do some explanation because I'm going to take some of the things that they're saying out of here and I'll show you some things and then we'll talk about some things and stuff. Right? It's funny. This is from... Where, where, who, who wrote this? Uh, this is from Vulture, right? This is their breakdown. And I wanted to take a day or two to think about it because I watched it the night it premiered. But I really wanted to take an extra day to, like, sit with it, to let it thaw in my brain, to see, <clears throat> could I think of anything else that was interesting that happened? So, essentially, this is where the true essence of the show begins, where the procedural actually starts. The first episode really just set up what the mystery is. There's a mystery of eight missing men who have disappeared from a polar ice station up in Alaska. They're in the fictional town of Ennis, which is not a real town. And what they end up, uh, and so far nobody knows exactly what happened, but they did find the bodies. And uh, I think that's one of the cooler aspects of the show, cooler, <laughs> is that they found these bodies tied up together, kind of like the thing. It, it's pretty, it, you know, it's kind of a throwback to them. They've decided to thaw out the bodies to discover them, and, and that's one of my criticisms of the show, but we'll get there. But yes, episode two, a slow thaw because the show's pacing. I think is one of the biggest issues. It's a long show, and it's interesting here. She says, this this writer from Vulture, Amanda Whitting, Whiting, whatever her name is, this week's episode of Night Country is as information-dense an hour of TV as I've ever seen. It's tempting to jump straight into logging the evidence. And this is what I find to be irritating about the show. The evidence that points in so many directions that police officers are still unsure as to whether or not a crime has even been committed. And I think part of the problem with the show, I like the idea that they're trying to solve the case now. And they're trying to move forward in it. They frankly don't have the resources in this town to do this. I don't think that eight missing people and six bodies constitutes what a small town police department can handle. They talk about whether or not they want to give it up to big city cops in Anchorage. Just to give you an idea of what Anchorage looks like. Well, not what it looks like, but what Anchorage is. Anchorage, the city itself, is as big, if not bigger, than Rhode Island. Fascinating. But the population in 2021 was 288,000 
121,000 people, right? That is less than Honolulu and Wyoming in totem. That's not a lot of people, folks. In all of Alaska, about roughly a little less than half of them live in in Anchorage, which means they I'm sure they have resources, but when you call about big city, okay, I'm sure the FBI would be interested in, um, you know, eight missing scientists and six dead bodies. But no, um, this uh, small town cop, Jody Foster, has the power to keep them and look she look they they right it's not it's not that it's terribly written she has explanations for everything it's in their code book that if you do if you thaw them too fast it could cause that i don't i believe all that's fine so i and i and i like the setting and i like the cinematography i just find the show to be poorly paced it's it's pretty boring there's a there is a little bit of like um you know the actors in it are not actors. They're like regular people who are pretending to be actors, which is also fine. But you get what you ask for when you get flat performances because you don't have legitimate, not le legitimate actors. Isn't when you have inexperienced actors for prestige television, it reminds me of that Mike Myers moment when he asked for a, I know it's just a bit part, but can we get a better actor in here? Like I keep saying that to myself. <clears throat> And uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't buy a lot of what's going on. There's this whole thing where they start trying to put this together. And, and I, I hear from several piece, people now, they're like, well, you know, Ennis is where the line between, you know, this universe and the next universe. And, and, and it's hard to distinguish whether or not there's been several instances of the corpses like screaming at people and we don't know, like, no one reacts to it. None of the actors react to it. So we don't know whether or not that's real or imagined. I just don't know. It doesn't, and they're just like, oh, you know how this place is, man. Uh, you know, the, the dead just show up. We just see dead by, okay. It's one thing to have, like, superstition. And another where, like, everybody's just like, yeah, I just see the dead. And, you know... Don't confuse seeing the dead with mental illness. Like, I, there's like these weird messages. And I'm like, who thinks of this? <laughs> Most people who see the dead are just straight up charlatans. So, you know, because you have some sort of like native, like fetishism, you're going to say that they're allowed to see the dead because they're connected to their history and that no one else has a history of any. Like, what are you even getting at here? Um... It's just strange. It's not like they're connected to some specific tribe that they're talking about. I, I, you know, it, it just doesn't like connect. The dots don't connect, and the actors come to, you know, the characters come to these realizations while they are set up on paper, like discovering there. There's a camper that gets discovered that's like connected from something else. Like, how do you know this guy that you randomly saw fishing? Well, I sold him my camper. Oh, well, the camper, what's it look like? Oh, okay. Oh, where would you hide someone if you could hide someone? In a place that none of us as the audience has ever heard of. They're like, it's in the Narrows or whatever. Oh, that's where you hide campers in Alaska? Like, what? They just come to these logical jumps that the audience is supposed to take with them that we just don't understand. That aren't set up properly. Uh, so... There's just a lot of like back and forth of things that I just I, I don't know whether or not they're seeing it too. And even at one point they film they have film footage for whatever reason of the one dude having like a spasm and turning around saying like she's awake. And it's clearly something that should disturb them and they're just like, oh, that's kind of weird, but whatever. And again, it's the same as like the corpses like waking up and moving yet. No one seems to acknowledge it. So are is this supernatural? Is it in our heads? Is it in their heads? Like, is it real? I just don't know. Um, and clearly there's all these like not red herrings, but there's just these like mystery boxes. I goddamn hate mystery boxes. I hate JJ Abrams. I hate everything he's done to pop culture. And I hate mystery boxes. Give us motivation as to why these characters are doing things. And they just kind of don't 
you know, there's something about a kid. He's probably dead. Like, I don't know. Like, she hates Twist and Shout because something happened with a kid. Just freaking tell us. It, it shouldn't be that big of a mystery. <coughs> the thing that I think is different from season one to season four, too, is the two character, the two lead characters. You you liked McConaughey's character. You liked Woody Harrell. You knew they were both flawed. Here you have a nihilist who completely thinks that the world is terrible and out to destroy everything and it's pointless and useless, but he's he his actions dictate that he cares, right? So he's doing the polar opposite of what you would think. Here's a man who thinks that the world should just burn. He's a nihilist. Nothing he does matters, yet he's working harder than anyone to solve these cases. And then you have Woody Harrelson, a deeply flawed man, yet you still know that he has enough skill in what he does to, you, you want to root for him. Let's take these two characters. While there's nothing against the, the state trooper, um, she's just very flat. Like, I, I, I get it that she cares for her, her sister or whatever, but... Like, why does she care so much for this one native girl who disappeared? They don't give you like, oh, she spent six months on this case and, you know, it reminds her of her sister or whatever. Like, they, they're not showing us what the connection is. It's just not there. And then you have Jodie Foster's character, who's just unlikable. In fact, they tell you in the show that she's unlikable. No one would actually like you. And she's been having affairs. She doesn't care. She doesn't care that the her her boss. She's she's having sex with her boss. Why that scene was put in, I don't necessarily need to see fifty nine year old Jodie Foster getting slammed like a can of hams. But whatever, man. If that's what floats your boat, you know, is there some sort of fetish for this? I don't know what's going on here. Dude practically has a heart attack doing it. But you have that scene. And she, everyone says she's unlikable, including she's fighting with her boss, who's like, oh, you're trying to oppose me or whatever. And the only person who does like her is the one detective, like the one kid cop who also, you don't even know what's going on with him. She treats him so terribly, it's almost hard, it's hard to root for her on any level. You know, she wants to, she wants to put this kid to sleep. Or, or his wife or his girlfriend wants him to, the kids wants to get, have him have a bath. He can't stop home for a couple hours. No, she goes to his house. She makes him stay and watch. She knows he has a young kid. Yet Jody Foster is making him stay and watch these bodies. There are other detectives or other cops you could put on this. You could put people on a rotation. You know he has a young kid. But instead she makes him stay there. And then people's reactions to these bodies make no sense either. You literally have teenagers who are just like, oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. They're just sitting there having a conversation. They're like 20-year-olds or whatever they are talking in and just having a conversation in front of these frozen dead bodies. You don't think that's disturbing? There are six dead men next to you, screaming corpses, whatever. You're just like, eh, whatever. No big deal. So that's what I don't like about the show specifically. So if you'd like to tell me why you do like the show, I've asked plenty of comments to tell me what do you specifically like about the show? Because I never complained that it was woke. Um, there is some dumb messaging in here, and there's some dumb feminist messaging, which it just doesn't make, like, girl boss power and stuff, and she practically ass assaults the one dude. Whatever, but... Again, I don't see a reason why I should like these characters. Please give me one. I would love to like these characters. I think they're incompetent and should not, this tiny little podunk department shouldn't be allowed to handle a case of this magnitude. And it should go to people who are more experienced. But no, it's, it's cool. We could just hang on to it. So this is way too much of a breakdown. Them following the tattoo around, calling it Fairbanks Tattoo Parlor. You literally found out nothing in that conversation. Absolutely nothing. There are so many conversations that don't forward the plot whatsoever. It's it, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. So, again, oh, yes. It was they found the RV in the nook. Like, we would know that. So, uh, again, let me know what you think. I keep watching it. Again, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. It's just I don't like the characters. Uh, I like I like the supernatural element. I like the the I this episode was definitely better than the first episode because I definitely like the procedural stuff. They're talking about like trying to solve the case. 
oh, you're not asking the right question. Okay, show me what the right, they, they didn't even answer that. Like, what is the right question? They, it, it just, it's somebody trying to think that they're smarter than they actually are when they're writing. And then maybe they should have written it with some other people. I don't know. Those are my thoughts. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments down below. I do read them all and I do respond. And, you know, look, I try to be pleasant. So you can try to be pleasant. If you like, if you don't, it's okay too. It's an indictment of you, not me. I'm okay with that. I feel good. So either way, thank you for listening. I do appreciate it. Either way, again, it's not the worst show I've ever seen, but it's definitely deeply flawed. Even this person who clearly likes the show is like the slow thaw because the pacing is terrible. So anyway, in the meantime, catch our full-length audio podcast. It's on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, those great places and more. We live stream here, 7.30 p.m., Friday nights, Eastern Standard Time. Come join the party. That's right here for you. Uh, and uh, join us. Help support the channel. We do appreciate it. We are growing. You can come super chat us. Do whatever you want to your heart's content because either way, we're going to love you. So that's all there is for me. That's all there is for you. But I'm on to the next one. <laughs>